seven o'clock here. My library's clock, which by mine is a bit slow, so I think we'll get off and running here. I'm Kathy Porsche. I'm currently the chair of the Lawrence Cultural Arts Commission, and I'm here to welcome you and make a few introductions and then turn this over to people who are actually in charge of running the public art for the library expansion project. Um, I'd first like to read just a, a brief bit of background here. The, the city established under resolution number 6774 a public arts policy back in 2008. And the policy reads, the Lawrence, Kansas City Commission may annually set aside to bond and other normal budgetary procedures an amount not to exceed 2% of the cost of all capital improvements constructed, constructed, acquired, or contracted for construction acquisition during the previous fiscal year for the acquisition, purchase, and installation of art in public places. And that's why with, the, with this uh, expansion of the library project, we have this opportunity for artists to put forward their uh, recommendations and their ideas for public art that would in some way work with this new installation. Um, I won't go further than that because I think our time is a little bit short, but you can find this resolution online. Am I correct, Diane? Yes. Yes. So if you ever want to look it up, it's on the city's website. Um, um, I'm going to first list the Public Art for the Library Expansion Project committee members. And uh, as I give your name, if you would stand up and maybe wave to the audience. First, uh, Mandy Enfield, Lawrence Cultural Arts Commissioner and Van Gogh Operations Manager. Um, I'm not seeing Mari, but Mari Russell is uh, Lawrence Cultural Arts Commissioner and she is Director of Haskell Indian Nation University's Tomini Library. <coughs> Jenny Cook is the Lawrence Public Library Children's Librarian and Artist. And an artist. Karen Allen is the Lawrence Public Library Teen Services Librarian. Um, Christopher Berger is a member of the Lawrence Public Library Board of Trustees and a trial attorney with Stephen, Stevens and Brand LLP. Um, Susan Craig is head of the Murphy Art and Architecture Library in the Spencer Museum of Art and a member of the Friends of the Lawrence Public Library and she's a former Lawrence Cultural Arts Commissioner. John Hatchmeister is KU Associate Professor of Sculpture and a community art project specialist who co-authored the book, Backyard Visionaries, Grassroots Art in the Midwest. And Harvey Robinson is fairly new to Lawrence, I believe, office manager and at the Lawrence Arts Center. And that is the current composition of the committee that will be reviewing the applications put forward and making recommendations to the city commission. Um, the agenda this evening's presentations will include a background on public library, the public library expansion project by Sean Zotke, back there, um, a public of in light of Tricia Carlin and Jenny Florence Public Library, a review of the request for qualifications for public art by Emily Cote, City of Lawrence, okay. and I'll then field some questions and answers up here. And at that point, Emily will question has heard it and get it on the video. It's being videotaped so that it's posted online and people can to it. Online, right? Um, and not here can hear what this was about. Now, I'm going to turn this over to the presenter. Sean. Thank you. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay back there? Sometimes a little soft spoken. So a little louder. Louder? Okay, I'll do it. Um, so what I'm going to walk through today is based on conceptual development of the library, a little bit of background, um, how the design sorted to where we are right now, and to give you some sense about both um, find the project and some views to give you some sense of spatial quality, the layouts, and the materiality of the, of the building. The, So um, 
this is a site plan of the of the library site with north being toward right uh, as you can see the the library is actually comprised of three parts actually four parts um, there's the renovation of the existing library there's an addition that wraps all the way around the perimeter of the library a plaza area um, um, towards the south of that and then the new uh, public parking structure um, a quick note on the plaza area. There's roughly a, a 12 foot differential in grade between Vermont Street and Kentucky Street. So it's about a 12 foot drop down. Um, the horizontal lines that you see here indicate um, tiers so that the, the plaza area itself will tear down the site. Um, the intent there is for it to create a natural amphitheater um, so that anybody or a person could actually present at the western side towards the, the Kentucky side. Um, it's also intended to be sort of a more public plaza type of function, um, something that's very civic in its nature and very open um, relative to how it's utilized. The main entry to the library will occur off of Vermont Street. Um, adjacent to the main entry where this sort of um, stranded concrete or stranded paving is an area that we're designating as a sculpture garden. And so that'll be an area that will have some paving, some landscaping integrated with it. Um, and then the parking structure itself will have two entry points, one off of Vermont Street, one off of Kentucky Street, and there'll be sets of stairs and I'll have some views that will show you what that looks like. Uh, but that's the general sense relative to the overall layout on the project. So the conceptual development of the building really started, um, when we started the design, or we began making daily trips to the library, and one of the patterns that we started to notice was that um, it was just always really populated in the areas adjacent to the windows. Um, throughout, it was just appeared to be a constant relative to the library's use. And as we were observing that, uh, we began to ask the question, what if we let the whole entire addition to the library actually constitute a public reading area, a place that had lots of windows in it, and a place where people would really want to gather. And that really became the, the initial concept behind the organization of the building. So that if you take the existing library, and you can imagine a perimeter reading area added all the way around it. Um, it could be an area that would be very public and open in its nature. Uh, it was an area that we were thinking of even as being sort of a public hall. Um, and it gave the opportunity then for the entire perimeter of that reading area to bring in natural light and to have sort of areas to sit and read and just sort of a naturally daylit portion all the way around the building. And that was a dramatic difference from the existing library if you've been inside of it where there are just a few pockets of sort of really nice daylit areas. Um, so a lot of the studies and a lot of the evolution of the project have occurred from that particular diagram. The other important diagram that we started thinking about was the sort of area that we're calling the core function of the library. Red and orange indicates the area that um, encapsulates the existing perimeter walls of the library, so all of the concrete fins that you see. Um, all of those areas were basically wrapping and we're plugging in the library main functions. And as we began working on sort of thinking about what those functions were, we gave a lot of thought relative just to the changing role of the library and how, you know, uh, media is changing, uh, prints decreasing, electronic prints increasing, and the role of the library is changing as well, from one being concentrated primarily on books to one that's actually starting to provide other functions from, you know, meeting areas, computer access, even social media. And it became an idea, really, that the library all about showing how these new roles and these new functions could participate and interact with the community. And that's really where we began to think about the development of the design. To take this idea of this core where all of the library functions from sorters to book checking to computers and really put them on display and really accessible to the community and that they be accessible off of that perimeter reading area that we, that we created. Um, these views start to show you what that starts to look like. So this is a view looking at the main entry lobby. Uh, the main entry lobby is designed to be a very open space. Um, 
On the south, this is view is actually looking due west. On the south will be a large glazed area with direct visual connection to that plaza area that we were describing. So all of those tiered sort of public functions will be directly off of the main entry. On the right, those sort of large doors that you see are entries into the auditorium space. The intent there being that the auditorium and lobby can sort of act as a, its own sort of function zone independent of the library um, so that it can work off hours and it can really be uh, a very sort of accessible to the public type of space. So the intent here is that when you walk in through the main door of the library, there's a very public and open and multifunction type of, of uh, opportunity. Um, as you move into the library, one of the first points of contact you'll see is be an information desk. And we're actually looking at this core area being something out of wood, um, something that basically provides a sense of warmth as you move into the building. Um, this view is at the southwestern corner of the library on the interior of that space. Um, towards the north, the reading area will start to, um, as it moves around the building, get more and more intimate in its nature. So the south main entry will be very wide. Um, it'll be all about lots of movement and standing areas. As you wrap around it, the area will taper down and get much more and more private and intimate. So finally, on the northern side, it will be a lot of just sort of one-on-one -on -one, um, chairs facing at each other, a place for a little bit more introspection, maybe. Um, this view is looking and starts to show those various sort of functions. So. Um, some of the actual book collection will be out there, uh, with the idea being that it'll be like a living room, uh, I think is a good term that we've used. Um, computer areas will be accessed off of there, and again, more of this sense of entry. And then on your right, and I think the next, on your right, you can start to see this idea of sort of this browsing library, or the sense that there's a lot less density and that the library is all about sort of being open and accessible and that the collection itself starts to become displayed that way and is accessible in a similar manner. This view is looking towards the north on the western side. Um, and so you can see how the book collection starts to wrap around that edge. And then, let's see, um, this is really a diagram talking about this idea of meeting space starting to plug into that zone. And so all of these slides are all about this sort of perimeter reading zone that wraps the existing fins of the library and starts to plug in new functions in different types of ways. And so shelves, meeting areas, um, even this idea that seating can start to be integrated within that area, and it's a series of cards. And then lastly, um, one of the other sort of components that we're looking at integrating is this idea of display or sort of public art. And that can happen on a variety of levels. It can happen on the level of an actual signature piece that we talked about. It can actually also support sort of more grassroots art that's developed within the community. Um, the exterior development really sort of was an outgrowth of a few studies. Uh, one was an energy analysis that we had done, and it occurred on several levels. Um, a series of diagrams to really give us an understanding of how the building functioned. And one of the things that we found is that the existing building really didn't function very well from an energy standpoint. And so this idea of wrapping the perimeter around that central fin area actually also insulated the existing library. Um, so much so that we're going to see a dramatic, we're, we're projecting a dramatic reduction in their energy usage uh, with the addition um, it can be in the realm of a 50% reduction over the building's current usage. But to do that, we were given certain prescriptive data relative to how the building's elevation should be designed and composed. And among that was ratios amount relative to the amount of window to wall, so solid area versus open area, and the idea that we need to bring light in from above to daylight the interior core stack area that, that currently is a little bit shut off from a lot of daylighting. And so we utilize those strategies in conjunction with um, this, going back to this question of how can the library serve the community, um, we begin to ask how can the sort of exterior envelope or skin function in a similar manner. Um, and so uh, we began to do an analysis of the different ways that that could, be, that could occur. And one was through this notion of vistas or being able to carve views in the library to really allow those core functions that we had diagrammed earlier really to start to show themselves off so that at the corners and at the intersections around the building, take for instance 7th in Vermont, that there'd be a very strong opportunity to see right into the heart of the library. And this idea is taken all the way around so that 
And you know, in the South Plaza area, we're looking at really opening up where you saw those interior windows in that view, really making a, a strong visual connection between that plaza and the lobby zone. Um, and then as well, we're looking at this idea that the envelope as well can start to respond in other ways. It can start to become seating, right? it can fold. Um, it can provide canopy or coverage, not just at the main entry, but in other areas around the building as well. I mean, it could even start to really provide the sense of overlook or being suspended above. Um, at the Northwest in particular, um, over here, because it's so high up and the building is sort of situated, it's, it's sort of uh, suspended above the, the drive that goes below. Um, it's a really great opportunity to provide an overlook to the park at the Northwest. And so this, is, this diagram is starting to talk about that notion. The other thing that we started to look at was really trying to provide a strong visual connection from the materiality to downtown. And to do that, what we were looking at using was a terracotta panel system, which essentially is brick. Um, these panels, though, just have a little bit more civic uh, module to them, so they're a larger module. They'll have more detail and more refinement than what you would see in a typical sort of brick wall. The other thing that's starting to be diagrammed here is this idea that the glazing itself, that the glass can start to participate uh, in sort of a really unique way with that wall system. So we can start to carve uh, openings around the perimeter that will provide really unique opportunities to engage with the building as you move around it. So every elevation is different. Even though the materiality will be the same, as you move around the building, it will reveal itself in different ways throughout the day um, and especially in different ways throughout the, the evening. So as the sun goes down, um, those areas will start to glow outward from the interior. And those corners that we talked about as being really sort of open and providing the ability to see inside will really start to glow and really advertise those core functions of the library. Um, this is a view looking e uh, excuse me, eastward um, up the plaza. Um, this shows you those sense of tears. Um, it starts to show you the materiality. So the, um, the libraries on the north are on the right hand, the left hand side. Um, and you can start to see the terracotta panels, the sense of opening. And then on the, on the right is the parking structure. Um, the materiality on the parking structure, what we're looking at is a perforated metal panel system um, with the intent that that panel system um, um, breathes and it allows a lot of air to go into the parking structure itself and will negate the need to provide any mechanical ventilation. It will also allow a lot more daylight to penetrate into the parking structure so it won't be kind of closed down around the perimeter and it will have an overall sense of being much more light, open, and sort of more airy because you can imagine wind will be able to still blow through it and it will be, uh, on some level, it will be self-ventilating. And so that probably brings me to um, the slide that was in the, the RFQ. Um, and basically what we tried to do here was illustrate where we saw various opportunities for art to occur within the building. Um, letter A um, is the gallery. That's basically that wood wall that you saw wrapping around the perimeter. Um, there's various ways that we can begin to, inter that we can begin to interact um, uh, in the display of art. And so it could be much more than just the display of the paintings on the wall like what was in that drawing. Uh, it could be creating niches or pedestals or platform or suspension areas. The idea being that that wall can really start to behave and really start to interact in, in various ways. And so that's an open opportunity. Um, the sculpture garden that we talked about adjacent to the main entry, um, I think that area is about 60 foot by 40 foot, so it's a pretty good sized room, roughly the size of this room, actually. Um, and it will, it, it again, will have a little bit more intimate scale than the open plaza area. Um, letter C is the atrium display, and in the middle of the library, we're looking at carving a new open below that will provide a connection between the main level of the library and the lower level. Um, it's the intent there is to really create a stronger connection to the basement so you don't feel like you're in another world when you're down there. Um, that also really opens up an opportunity for a sort of a larger multi-story type of, of um, exhibit or display or, or suspension item. Um, letter D is the community plaza. It's that tiered plaza zone. Um, 
The space between uh, the library and the parking structure is around 80, 85 feet, I believe. So it's a pretty broad area. And each of those terraces, each of those steps is approximately 30 to 36 inches. And so um, that series of plateaus is, is an opportunity out there. Um, and then lastly, the parking structure facade. Um, the idea being that um, you know, we can work with, with somebody to actually start to determine what those perforations could be or how the facade itself could start to react and that potentially the materials that are used on that facade could be utilized by, uh, by, by somebody. And I think that said is, yes, that's it. So any questions or, yes? Do you have any drawings of the atrium area? Um, I, can, I can add a sectional drawing uh, to this package, and I think once we're done here, uh, we're going to release a set of these drawings or diagrams that, that will augment with a section of that atrium space. Yes. Um, you indicated in some of the interior areas that there would be two-dimensional work. Does that include um, video? Uh, certainly, I think. Because it would mount it on a. Certainly, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that. Um, I think that the, every opportunity is implied there, that if there's some idea relative to how to engage with that wall, we would be open to it. So certainly video. Can you talk about the trees on the site? Sure. Um, plans for the existing trees, uh, trees drawn into the, your drawing there, but I don't know if those would, would uh, include existing trees or if they would be new trees. Some of the existing trees, uh, in particular along the western edge are going to be impacted by the development. Um, and so these are, a lot of these trees are new trees. Um, that's primarily because of the grade changes that are occurring and some of the other functions that we're starting to look at plugging into the lower level of the library. Um, our goal um, is to keep most all of the trees on the northern elevation. And so there's like one that's right up against the building there. That one's probably, um, that one probably won't make it, but most of the other trees we think are far enough away, and we've tried to keep the addition on the north shallow enough to keep those. And then I think that um, uh, there's a likelihood that the ones on the eastern elevation, uh, I think we really just need to analyze them. I believe that they're ashes, uh, so they're probably going to uh, be impacted by the bug that's coming this way. What kind of wood are you using on the interior? We're looking at a variety of options right now. Um, they're, the range that we're looking at are all hardwoods. Um, so the, the range there would be from white oak, sycamore, ash, hickory uh, is the general range that we're talking about. You said that some of the, there's an opportunity to use some of the material, the building materials to offset to help the artists what do you mean by that, or can you give us a list of the materials that might be available, or in what capacity might we access those? I think primarily those materials would be the, um, currently in the development, the, the facade of the parking structure. So that's really the raw sheet metal um, and the access to the perforation system. Um, when we take that, that system, it will be perforated by a contractor or a subcontractor or a manufacturer. Um, there is actually the ability to designate that pattern of imprint and potentially to actually study the way in which the panel itself is folded. Um, other areas on the project I think we can look at on, a, on, a, uh, on the basis of the idea. Uh, I mean, I certainly um, want to imply that we're really open to, to other ideas. Um, so um, if there are other out there, we'd be happy to, to talk about them. Yes? I may have missed, but is this all one level, and how tall are the ceilings? It is actually um, two levels. Uh, there's the existing lower level of the library. Our addition will meaning all... Meaning the basement, or meaning... Yes, the lower okay. level of the basement, and the, the addition will all be on one level, all the way around. The existing ceilings of the library, I believe, are uh, to the underside of structure, about 14 feet. Um, and so within the existing building will be 14 feet, and the addition, It'll be roughly 17 feet. So, so you're you're right, basically working within this shell and, and adding um, a skin around it with space in between them. And, uh, Correct. Okay. So the underside of the shell uh, on the addition it will be 
roughly around um, roughly around 17 feet, I believe. What is what are we gaining here? What is what are we gaining for by this new design that we don't have? Um, you're gaining, first of all, additional area for the children's section. So the children's section is doubling in its size. Um, there's additional reading space. Um, the increase in size of the more public access components to the library, including meeting spaces, um, the actual popular collection, computers, um, um, an enlarged meeting area with increased functional support for the meeting space. So there, there's a variety of different programmatic things that we're adding. Has the issue of acoustics been addressed? We are looking at acoustics as we're developing the interior volumes um, and as we wrap around a perimeter. So certainly, um, a lot terms of hard of, surfaces and yeah. open spaces and in a place that's normally supposed to be pretty quiet. Mm -hmm. Certainly. So around the perimeter reading area, I think we're looking at utilizing acoustical decks. Um, and certainly on the interior where the stacks are and the larger open area is, uh, we're looking at two levels of, of taking care of the sound. One is just the absorption relative to the deck itself and making sure that we have the sound not bouncing back down. And then looking to create some level of acoustical separation between the children's area and the adult section. When you say the deck, are you talking about the interior? Yeah, the interior rope deck up above. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. There are emergency exits? Yes. Um, I have a question about the artwork display areas. Are those for permanent artworks, or are those um, also rotating exhibits? I believe the intent is no matter what, there will be a location for rotating exhibits, and there will be the potential to also exhibit uh, a permanent piece if that's, if that's the option selected. Yes? Was there, you mentioned about more lighting in the stacks or something. Was, is there some kind of downlighting or skylighting opening up? What we're looking at right now, and that's something that we're currently studying in more detail. Yeah, okay. finalize that. Yeah, uh, but we're looking at a combination of methods to bring natural light into the core stacks. And will that be in the atrium too? Do we have natural lighting there? Yes. Um, yes, go ahead, I'm sorry. Near, near the front entrance, I think you had some sort of, um, you said like the door to the, or openings to the auditorium, they were kind of like garage doors? Door. More or less they're like garage doors. Mm -hmm. And the intent is that they uh, create the, the space between the fins, I believe, is, is uh, it's, it's between seven and nine feet uh, between the existing concrete fins. And so the intent when you move through those fins is to open that area completely up so that you can move from the so that you can move from the interior of this auditorium space out into this lobby. So that will end up being roughly about 20, 25 to 27 feet of just open space that will allow sort of a it'll allow the lobby to act as a, a support sort of viewing for the auditorium space, as well just as a pre-function area to the auditorium. Will they be moving at all? They, they will be. They'll be able to be raised up. I'm sorry. Yes? Um, the presentation shows the perforated metal uh, on the parking garage to the north. Are the other three sides visually inert, or, or, or intended that that effect wrap around the entire structure? I think the intent would be that it would wrap around the structure, actually. Uh, the entire structure is all perforated, um, and we need that just for the ventilation alone. Um, and so I think the intent would be we would try to wrap it. I think you were next. I'm sorry. Uh, how, how much more specific information in terms of actual, in order to you know, really sort of begin to conceptualize work for a particular place in the library, will we be able to get <clears throat> diagrams that indicate ideal wall spaces and, and um, you know, with more information than what we have in this pit. Elevations and dimensions. Excuse me? Elevations and dimensions. Details. We can certainly augment I'm, I'm, the, I'm, I'm, we can certainly augment the package with the uh, dimensional criteria if that if you would like that. That's that's pretty easy for us to put together. Some renderings. Yeah. Renderings of actual renderings of the sure. floor plan with, you know, the 
the locations where there would be wall space and sure. um, okay yes I think we can certainly get that that put together that would be great. you might have already addressed the lighting I know you mentioned skylights what about for the evening in this exterior space and also outside the room we are looking at uh, multiple levels um, the lighting over the main reading area um, uh, will be um, lit in, in three ways. Um, actually, the space itself, if you look at it, will have light coming in from clear stories on each on, on um, the interior side relative to the core. And then we'll also bring natural light in through the perimeter. Um, we've been working with electrical engineers to pinpoint exactly what the uh, shading criteria for the glass has to be on its particular elevation. And in addition to that, we'll augment that obviously with electric light for, for the evenings. And that same will go for the well, interior of the core too. Do you know what, you know what you're thinking of? It will likely be fluorescent. There may be some LED. Um, that's the level of detail that we're diving into right now. We have to consider the light colors for the artwork though. You know, on the wavelength of the light, lights you sure. use to make sure the artwork sure. is presented the way it's created. Sure. Certainly, and I think that's something we'd be happy to, but we haven't designated specific lighting yet, and that's just partially due to the phase of construction that we're in right now, or phase of design that we're in. Um, that will be sort of developed here within the coming weeks. Uh, but in general, we're looking at primarily, it's likely to be primarily fluorescent lighting around the around those particular areas. You also, the perforated metal panel is still, you're deciding as to what it is going to be able to look like perforation sizes? Yes. I think the intent relative to the, the date that we've talked about um, uh, is to allow some time that if an option like this is elected to proceed with it, um, that there be time enough for us to coordinate it and get it into the documents so that we can share it with the contractor. And the, char the, the characteristics of the perforated metal panel will be available before October 5th? Yes. Are you imagining that uh, metal panel as a naturally sort of oxide forming surface that looked brown? Cortan? Like Cortan. Yeah. Um, I believe it will likely be a painted surface, uh, like a kind of finish on it, uh, rather than a Cortan or an oxide surface. Yeah. So, Sean, um, about the metal surface, so uh, were you implying that an artist could? Um, work with you to help decide what kind of perforations, how it's folded, but that could be an aspect. Yes. Okay, so I just want to get clear. Here. Yes, yes. I think I think that's a little bit unknown how exactly that would work. We've seen examples on, of, uh, out there uh, where where either digitally an image has been grabbed or designed or implemented within a series of perforations. But I think the intent is that it's that. I don't want to necessarily restrict uh, what that would be. Yes. Um, I, I think I have two questions. Um, first, if no local artist or, or artist is interested in designing the preparations, who designs those and we, how do they get decided? We are in the process of doing that and it will be much more on the basis of the sort of engineer ventilation requirements. And mm -hmm. so there will be perforations regardless. Uh, I think the attribute relative to this idea potentially would be that there would be um, both um, uh, the ability to actually handle some of the customization that would be required, um, that uh, because there would be a little bit more um, um, detail and time that a fabricator would actually take to actually create the preparations. Um, and so I think the intent there is be that 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 somehow we work through that uh, in this process. As it stands, there will be a baseline perforation. We'll probably base it upon um, some standard requirements relative to the ratios that we need for ventilation. So from a financial standpoint, would the funding that's available for the, for the percentage for art be used to pay the artist for the design work, or would some of that have to go towards paying for the perforations being put in? I think that that's probably both. There will, I mean, the up, there will be some ups, up charge, obviously, to handle the customization for the perforations. And so um, um, that's likely to come out of that, that amount. Um, and 
then I think the idea here is that if there's an ability to leverage the material, that we would we would have it be a portion of the construction documents. Um, obviously, there's a lot of details that would have to be resolved. You know, what is the design? What preparations would be desired? How would that system work with the subframe that we're providing? Um, and so, um, as we're you know, as we're working through those details, I think um, I think that criteria would be called into play. Um, currently, I think what we're looking at is. Be a steel backup frame system to support that off of the edge of the off of the edge of the parking structure, and that the metal skin will hang off of that suspension system. Um, and so as long as we, that skin will run continuous beyond it, so the ability to manipulate it or change it should be uh, should be there as long as the contacts or the anchoring points are consistent from design to design. Um, the community plaza area, it says it has um, the exterior, has um, where I think it displays, and we mentioned something about the wall, that it'll be stuck where you can do something on the wall. Of the? Of the uh, uh, exterior of the community plaza. So the, I think the wall that we were talking about is probably the same wall for the parking structure that we were just discussing. Oh, okay. okay. The, the south wall of the plaza is, back up here. Okay. So the parking, this is the wall that we're talking about that has So what are the other, because it says it has um, a variety of displays and site integration. What other other right. in that area? Sorry, I'm going to zoom ahead now. <laughs> so um, I think the other areas that we were talking about were this perimeter gallery zone. Oh, okay. That there's multiple display options that will occur around that perimeter. Okay. There's a variety of, there, there, um, the reading area is sort of, designed to be this open, those per what you've seen in those renderings, this sort of open area that wraps around that core. Um, that core is continuous all the way around the perimeter, and so we can adjust and sort of let it uh, react to a piece of it if there was a piece that was designated there. Could, um, like, the stairs in the, in the D area, the out exterior, um, the community plaza area, can those be considered to do something on? This? Yes. I, I, you know, the, uh, the main intent on this diagram was really to say, hey, here's some ideas. Um, and certainly uh, we weren't trying to be restrictive or uh, about any other ideas that may be out there. Yes. Um, when talking about the trees and, and materials that might be available on site, would it, if trees have to be taken out, are they available to an artist to, say, expand the project? wood in some way, and, and if so, how would that work? Um, I think that would be partially a question for a contractor. Um, certainly, we can we can ask the contractor as part of this process to, to salvage any trees that are removed and to you know, store them aside or, or turn them over to an artist. And so that, I believe that wouldn't be too difficult to, to achieve. Yes? Um, I'm thinking long-term, and this might not, this might be a question for our new director. Because we don't have them for the city for our public art, and I would hope, I would hope we would someday. Mm. It's not a specific identifier funding source for that. Um, however, that's something that the art solution is is um, actually going to be discussing here later on this fall. That's a good question. I'm sure that um, you know, as things are identified, where they need to be repaired. In the atrium display, it also mentions construction materials may be available to the artist. What did you have in mind there? Um, there is, um, um, in the development and the continued development, there are some ceiling treatments that uh, we are unfortunately still in the process of developing. Um, so um, those are likely to be, again, a plaster or a perforated system. Um, I think. I think that um, early on we were thinking about actually sculpting that system up there that it could be shaped or contorted or formed and that um, you know, whatever ceiling material that we were selecting at that time could be utilized at that location. What we're, what we're, um, 
what that material is likely to be is it's likely to be like a plaster or some system like that. Um, and so part of me actually wonders whether or not the, um, the idea of spinning below that or integrating with that would be much more feasible or much more desirable um, just to not have to deal with some of the um, uh, uh, sort of blur between what the contractor is doing and what the artist is doing. Some areas it's a little bit easier to designate. I mean, the questions that we had about the north face or the parking structure facade, you know, there's some gray areas in there and there's some details that we would have to get out to resolve those questions. Um, um, and, and so it's not like black and white right now. And, and a lot of it's dependent upon what we would see from, from the artist and, and how we would work with them. So, so there's a skylight above the atrium and then you're talking about a sub ceiling Something it's else? it's likely to be uh, it's unlikely to be a skylight. Um, it's more likely to be either a solar tube or a clear story of some type. Um, the intent is to bring natural light from above, um, and so it's unlikely to be via a skylight. And then there will be some ceiling hung adjacent to that opening. Um, and you know that's again that's something that we're in the process of reviewing with the building committee, and we've kind of we've kind of reviewed a few options with them, and. and We've yet to make the final selection on that system. Yes. A um, couple of quick questions. Um, one, do you know what technology you'll be using for doing perforations in the metal? Would it be like laser cut, water it, jet? It's yeah. likely to be a much more of a uh, dive sort of perforating machine. That uh, I don't know the exact name of it, but it's, yeah. I've seen it. It's like on a big plate. Yeah. So it's just costs associated making different dives. Do, do you have a of the metal? That's something that we're actually currently trying to finalize. It's, it's a rate we're going to make that determination um, based upon the sort of most economical spans that we can get relative to the substrate for it. Yes? Are you considering um, severe weather in this situation? I, mean, I don't think we want our perforated metal parking garage going sideways across downtown Lawrence. <laughs> yes, we are. We'll be utilizing all the wind loads to, and our engineers will be reviewing that both from the anchoring into the concrete, clear into the anchoring of the perforated system into the substrate. Yes. Yeah, and um, the, in the public plaza area, I noticed that you showed grass in that stepping down. Mm -hmm. Is that a decision that's being made about functional um, requirements? Or is that I think the intent on the grass is to make that area as flexible as possible. And so, um, and, and what that means is, is remove as many barriers as we can. So grass seems to be the most obvious choice. Yes? Hey, uh, it'd be really nice, as soon as you have it available, to have a, like a little board with the types of samples of materials you're going to use in these areas. It might make a huge difference in what kind of materials we use. Just okay. probably a little more visually. Sure. Sean, I'm curious about because you've got five different places given the budget. Um, there's probably no way you can get five different pieces out of that. So what, what are you really looking for? Sort of a, you know, the call for entries and see what kind of artwork you like and then you make a judgment and then you know, get a finalist? So I'll, I can venture into answering this one. Okay. That's okay. I think the intent is to provide options or opportunities. And right. So you could completely ignore this sheet, actually. I think the intent here was really just to say, hey, the architects and the building committee and the libraries open some ideas. Here's, here's some initial ideas that we've, we've seen. Um, but again, I don't think the intent is to say that you have to get all five of them or that you're limited to any of those. Um, it was really just trying to, to initiate the conversation as much as I yeah, sure, There's that one stipulation to add a sketch or something. So this is, I think, why sort of interested in all the material aspects of it, but it may be premature. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. Um, yes. so after an artist is chosen, is the process, are you planning to work with the artist additionally to hone down what that um, yeah. actual piece or installation will be? I think the the intent for us, and at least for the art for the architect, is to get some sense to, uh, of where the art may be going in the building. Um, 
Um, so if it impacts the facade, the parking structure, for instance. That's, that tells us what we that tells us what we tell the contractor, um, and that's really our intent is just to figure that out. I think after we know that, we can designate that area as being flexible relative to how we work with the artist. And so if it's and again, it can vary depending on the piece. Um, if it's in the sculpture garden, it, if it needs one thing. It's on the interior gallery, it's another. And so I think our intent is to be as flexible as we can. So it sounds like you're looking to collaborate with an artist. Yes. I think on that note, we should um, uh, hold further questions until we get to the Q&A period and move on to the examples of art and art. In libraries, the examples of art in libraries, because I think that will spark some further discussion that might also uh, Okay, so I'm going to talk about who is eligible, uh, the selection process, and uh, what we're requiring for the response, and then important dates. So um, we had a packet in the back, and I hope all of you picked one up of the RFQ. Um, if you didn't, hopefully there are, are there still any left back there? There's no more left. Uh, we have, there's a couple left. Okay, yes, and they are online. So, um, this RFQ is open to all established professional artists in the United States, but preference is given to those artists who have resided or who reside in Kansas currently. Um, and also, uh, a group of artists may have, may join together for the concept and may respond to the RFQ. Um, so if you are wanting to collaborate with another artist or form an artistic team, you may submit one response and it can be considered. Okay, so the selection process is in two phases. So the first is the submission of the RFQ. And the second phase is once the panelists receive all the responses, they're gonna go through them and pick a few finalists. And I don't believe that number has been selected yet, um, but they're going to pick a few finalists and those finalists will be invited back to the library to um, define their proposal in more depth and um, to give an interview. And then from those finalists, one will be selected. Um, just basic qualifications, what we're looking for. Um, we're looking for someone who has experience in public art with capital projects, with the construction of new buildings. Um, Professional credentials demonstrated by all your submitted materials. Um, achievement of the library's vision for the art, and that hasn't been talked about tonight, but um, just to give you a brief summary of what the library is envisioning for this, um, they're looking for something that's, that embodies the mission of a library, but is not traditional. So maybe not necessarily books, but uh, something a little bit more broader, I suppose. That's what the library is looking for. Um, strength of past artworks. So focusing on work that is durable, permanent, um, appropriate for public spaces. Um, so um, no strange, um, unsafe pieces of art that could potentially hurt someone in the public. Um, experience fabricating and installing permanent artwork and experience working with this side of the budget. And the budget for this project is $75,000. And that's why we're starting this RFQ process now, and it's such a short response time, because we wanna maybe augment the budget with um, construction materials from the contractor and work with the architect. But that doesn't have to be the case. If the artist we select has an installation or a piece that has nothing to do with the architecture, that's perfectly fine too. Um, and then we want someone who has experience working with a team because you'll be working with local government officials, with library staff, um, and uh, with the architects and the contractors. So um, your responses must be submitted electronically at this address. And um, the address is in the packets as well. And we're looking for five things that we would like submitted electronically. Your letter of interest, which details your interest in the project, your ideas, who you are, your past works, and your connection to Kansas. 
And your connection to Kansas is very important, especially if you don't live here in the state and you want to learn more about that. Um, we'd also like your professional resume, uh, a sketch or appropriate or an appropriate visual representation. And we understand that this might be um, asking for a lot at this stage, but this is very preliminary. We just want a general idea of where maybe you would like the art to go or what you are thinking. Just very general. It doesn't have to be very specific. Um, then we would like an annotated image list of your past works, limited to 15 images. And on the electronic submission site, you will not have a place for 15 images to be submitted or uploaded. We would like you to put those images into one document and then upload the document. So my recommendation would be, because we have limited space um, for the upload, that um, you would need to uh, shrink the images to get them to fit. Because if you're having problems uploading the document, uh, you might want to think, oh, I'll go out and shrink the photos and reattach them to the document um, if you're having problems. You can also contact the webmaster and he can help you with that too. But if you notice you're having problems, think maybe I should shrink the images. So just putting that out there. And then we would like three references who can speak about your artwork, your past works who've worked with you on, pro uh, on projects. Um, and we need their addresses and phone numbers so we may contact them. Okay, so important dates. Friday, October 5th at 4 p.m. Central Time is when everything is due. Um, I forgot to mention, if you have any video or audio that you would like to submit with your response, we cannot take those electronically. So, you may mail your audio or uh, video on a CD to City Hall, and the City Hall's address is in the, the RFQ packet. Um, so the only thing is we must receive all of those materials by the deadline. If we don't receive it by the deadline, it will not be considered. Um, but everything else about the RFQ must be submitted electronically. The only thing that we will receive through the mail would be your video or audio if you happen to have that. Then the selection panel will review everything after we've received all the responses about mid-October, and then uh, the second phase finalists will be notified at the end of October. Okay, and these are a few anticipated questions. Uh, will there be additional images of the library project available to view? And we sort of talked about this already. There will be. Everything you just saw tonight that Sean spoke about will be online, um, and other images that you said that you need will also be there. And we'll try to have them posted by next week sometime. Um, and the second question we anticipated is, are there any types of preferred art for the project? And no, there are no preferred types of art. We're open to any ideas that you have, any ways to incorporate your installation into the architecture, or even if you don't want to do that, any medium of art is we don't want to limit any creativity here. So if you have a great vision for what should be here, please send in your response. And if you have any other questions besides tonight, if you think of something else, you can contact Diane Stoddard, who is the assistant city manager and the city liaison for the Lawrence Cultural Arts Commission. And then I have the websites up here, which are also in the RFQ packet that you can get ad additional information from. And those websites, well, the library's website is where you will find the images that, that we're going to add. And all possible designs we come up with. Does each person submit one concept? Or okay. do you think these say have several concepts for several areas? I don't really understand it yet. Um, well, the question was, would the artist submit one concept or several concepts for different places, considering that there are many different types of things that you can do or to incorporate the art. That's your question, right? Yes. Um, and I don't know what, the, I think one concept for one response. Yeah, I can do take that. I think the intention of the group was to receive one concept um, from, from the artist and then a statement to accompany that concept. And then, you know, probably your other works of art will also help the committee in their review. And uh, those that are on the committee may want to also speak. I just have a comment. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I just want everybody to know that the
The City of Lawrence has a board for, for, art, for the last several city projects. This is a jobs program for artists, and we need to keep the heat on the city commissioners. They wanted to ignore this, but Diane Stoddard, yay Diane, our <laughs> Cultural Arts Commission pushed and pushed, and this is happening. So don't let the city say we're a city of the arts and then not hire the artists. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Um, I was just wondering if, uh, with the other illustrations and sketches um, to be uploaded next week, if maybe they could include um, what they are envisioning for the children's space. Um, because I know that right now it has a lot of open windows, and if there's like a, a case that goes around the library, I'm just curious to know like what the space in there would look like, and if they could add, add an illustration of that um, with the others next week. Sure, I assume, uh, Sean, would you be able to add space, the children's space the image? Um, we, um, we, will, we will be able to uh, share anything that we've, been able, that we've sort of worked through the building committee in the, in the process with. Some areas of the children's zone in particular, uh, uh, we may not have all the information for. Certainly we can uh, uh, make some indication of the more public areas. Sure. Um, so we will take a, we will try to convey what we know. Okay, thank you. Sure. Can you also uh, provide an elevation from for the atrium area? Yes, we will provide. We'll provide the section through that area that, that uh, I think we had talked about before. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you said that that one artist will be chosen. So, are you envisioning one project, one artist does it for seventy-five thousand? Are you looking at picking several artists with varying budgets? It, um, we are looking at picking one artist, one project, or the artistic team. So one response okay. for their project. Yes. Are you trying to impact all those areas that you show? Do you want the artist to impact all those, or pick just one of the elements? So the question is, do we want the artist to impact all the areas that were shown on the uh, last page of the RFQ? And no. we don't have any limits on it. Those are just general ideas for, for you, for the artist. So if the artist would like to do something in the atrium, that is great and that's fine. But if the artist um, has an installation that involves nothing to do with the architecture, that is also perfectly fine. And we're open to that as well. But we just wanted to give a general idea to the art I'm trying to figure out whether you're trying to spread your money all the way around that, that area or... No, the 75000 can go towards anything that any art any, any one project. of those places. Right, yes. So, yes. so the corollary is you have a $75,000 wonderful in one of those spaces, potentially, and the others are sitting naked. Well, <laughs> I... I With prison, I, I don't think that they would be sitting naked. The, the, it doesn't mean that these spots will not have anything, but they won't have the art. But they will be architecturally worked with it. They, they will go with the design. The architects will provide so that. So money will be spent. Yes, 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 yes. But yes. it won't necessarily be money that's earned by anybody in this room. Right. <laughs> What project is most heavily weighted to succeed? The perforated oh. metal, the atrium? Is the question there? is what project is most heavily uh, weighted. weighted to succeed? And um, I can't speak to that. I don't think that there is a weight. There is no, there is no preference on what project. So uh, is that, that's correct. Yes. Is it possible that um, through the years, more artwork might be um, purchased for the library's permanent collection, like the sculpture garden or two-dimensional pieces? Um, the question is, uh, will, throughout, in the future, will, is there an opportunity for more art to be purchased for the library? And, right, I mean, we, we, we don't have an art budget like the Topeka Library currently has, for example, you know, I mean, that would be something we'd have to consider. Currently, we, we have no expenditures for that. We will we'll continue to have rotating collections as, you know, we currently always have four rotating 
believe quarterly. Is that right? Uh, things that we that, that we that we organize. So I mean, we will we will continue um, to provide spaces, but whether we're able to have some type of a permanent art gallery that that we would start to collect for a permanent collection, that would just remain to be seen uh, how we would manage our budget. We'd love it. I just don't know at this point whether we can. I'm sure some it. of us would be happy to donate a piece as long as the library approved it. We certainly would be interested in continuing those conversations for sure. I mean, believe me, I've worked in a library that has an art gallery in Topeka, and it, and it can be quite lovely to have. So we can continue. Yes, it, it, it is. Hey, you've got a, a, a loose budget that's kind of not really well defined, and I, I only bring that up because neither is the, the rest of it quite yet. So we're proposing something, we're making sketches on an unknown budget. I know that's well, really the budget is seventy-five thousand. So you say it that can be it can grow depending on if you're going to um, use well if you use materials. But what about your process? Because you seem to include the um, just to know you know what you're working with um, the process of finding the artist costs something, and that is taken out of that. So seventy-five thousand, or is that not the case? Um, no, no costs are associated with finding the artist. The LCAC is a completely volunteer board, and everybody on the selection committee is volunteers. I, I only say that because as long as that's that's clear, I, I know there was another like the firefighter one where mm -hmm. a lot of budget was spent on bringing artists in, and then the budget was quite a bit significantly reduced. That's not the case here. That's right. No. We yeah, don't have any money to maximize the. Maximize the budget for the art. Yeah. Um, I have a question that um, in the RFQ there's quite a lot of talk about um, interactive, a really strong um, desire to see participation in things. And uh, it's been my experience that that kind of work usually requires some oversight. And um, I'm just wondering is, is the thinking that that would be, that you already have departments in the library that are doing things like exhibitions and things like that, so they would be willing or interested to participate with new kinds of participatory things that come into the library. Is that true? Um, the question is about interactive art and how it will be maintained right. within the library. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how to you mean would staff be able to maintain its interactivity or I I'm, yeah I, I mean sometimes interactive things change over time and um, there needs to be somebody on site who's keeping an eye on it or who's you know changing something around or I'm just wondering is there a structure for that or is that something that should be really avoided <laughs> well, we certainly we don't have anything in place for that at the moment you know I mean if there were some concept that seemed like it would be manageable, I, you know, I mean, we're we're always open to being flexible. But whether we could support something like that, I, I couldn't say at this point. That's a great question, uh, but we don't have anything in place currently to. Are you going to have a, a staff person for the new? I see you're having a new like electronic area with video and and sound. So if you're going to have a staff person that's working in that that area, will. That, that's the plan. We're, we're looking at how we're going to, to reorganize to accommodate some of the new spaces that we're going to have, and that, that isn't worked out in great detail at this point, but that's our goal at, at that end, is to have not necessarily somebody who knows how to record rock bands, how to make a documentary and those things, but have some cursory knowledge and, and definitely have some kind of network. And, and have some, we will have people who are supervising that space and the curation of that space. I have kind of an interesting question. At the beginning, Kathy um, opened up the conversation with the concept of this 2%. Since it's a public library and we're all public here, is there a way we can find out what the total budget is and how we got the 75? Um, I believe that. Yes, Diane, can you answer this question? Yeah, and I might um, ask you, Sean or Brad, is, is there around 19 billion, the, the entire project? Is that right? The, the bond is 18. There's a million dollars that was raised in a capital campaign. The garage is about five million of it. The building is 
roughly 14 to 15 million dollars the building's actually closer it's it's lower than that it's closer or that's true that's the furniture costs and things yeah yeah it's closer to the eight eight uh eight to ten million dollar range so that two percent well yes it's not two percent yeah. but what did they call it two percent because the maximum is up to 2%. Oh, okay. They should call it up to 2%. Up to 2%. I think it's called percent per art. Oh, okay. It's a good question, but it, I think it is percent per art. Does the city have a contract uh, in place for this project? The contract for the artist? Yeah. Um, I don't believe so. Diane. There, there would be a contract with the artist that is chosen for the project, but there is not a contract in place currently. So it's not an artist. But it's a contract that the city has. I don't understand your question. Would it be between, you're asking, would the it's contract be between the city and the no, artist? A lot of times the artist has to make the contract. And okay. the city looks at it and says yes or no. I'm curious if the city oh. already has the contract. I imagine that we have a contract that can be used as a form before, but we don't have a set contract now. <coughs> we, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't also be needing to start from scratch. We can work with the selected artists on that. Has construction date uh, to begin been set? Yes, we're looking to start construction, um, just like the site being opened up. Um, roughly November, um, and the library is due for completion in um, um, spring of 2014. Uh, the parking structure was shooting for completion spring of 2013, um, hence some of the dates that we've set right now. Any other questions? Okay, well, you, oh, yes. Will there be an honorarium for the artists that are chosen to submit the final proposals? Diane, will there be an honorarium? The committee has not discussed that at this point, and I think the committee will discuss that um, um, when they get to that point. Uh, however, again, I think the intention of the committee is to try and maximize the budget for the art and the artists that's selected. Well, if you have any further questions, uh, please don't hesitate to contact Diane Stoddard or any of the cultural liaison uh, the commissioners who uh, are Mandy or Kathy. So. Okay, and um, with that, I will turn it over to the library to talk about public art and libraries. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest. Every level of experience the library provides space where local artists and groups can share their creative expression in a public venue, from school groups to senior clubs to renowned professional artists. The library will continue to serve this purpose by incorporating exhibit area into the renovated building. In contrast, the purpose of the Percent for Art Purchase is to commission a permanent public artwork that will serve as a showcase piece to inspire the public imagination. This piece should stretch beyond a traditional interpretation of libraries and speak broadly to our mission to build community, share stories, and instill a love of learning and creative pursuits. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. And by the way, my name is Patricia Carlin, and I work here at the library, and I'll be sharing some um, fun visions of public art that's been done throughout the country. And uh, with my colleague, Jane Cook, we'd like to um, express our appreciation to people for sharing images with us. And those people are Liz Kowalchuk uh, with the University of Kansas, Porter Arneal, who is director of the Kansas City Municipal Arts Commission, and the organization, the Americans for the Arts. Um, we have some examples uh, that we think will um, help spur the imagination for this project, maybe start the discussion of what's possible. Some of the projects are um, on a pretty grand scale, grander than we will probably be able to implement here. 
But we um, uh, just love um, kind of opening uh, people's ideas to what's possible with public art and what can be done. So the first is a fun uh, installation called Laser Lawn by Dan Corson. And the artist talks about how lawns are ubiquitous and turf and sod is the biggest irrigated crop in the United States. But with the use of lasers, um, he um, has, gives us a new eye to something that we see every day, every day. The artist says, moving light simulates and stimulates the growth of the lawn, the flooding of the fields, the sparkle of the dew on the grass. The kinetic patterns on the lawn animate the grass for the people to explore and play with light. Uh, some of you are familiar with the, the uh, late Dale Eldred, who was an artist based in Kansas City. And he designed this sculpture for a library. It reflects sun, refracts sunlight during day hours and artificial illumination at night. And so there, with the refraction, there's a constant shifting spectrum of colors. The artist's statement, what is important in this work is not in the structure itself, not in its object nature, but in the phenomena which take place on its surface. The sculpture is a very carefully constructed receiver designed to intercept and manipulate light, to expose its properties and components, and to allow this light in its daily passage across all our surfaces to prod us a little in our geocentrist illusion. This is a fun um, installation that was done in um, San Francisco, and the artist took photographs of people that he encountered on the street, people that live, work, and play on um, Market Street in San Francisco. Um, he said the images are meant to reflect the diversity of people who live, work, and play there while expressing the similarities that also exist between us all. And it's a really great community-based um, project that gets at the notion of identity. What, how are we the same? How are we different? What is different about each of us? Um, so that whole identity uh, question is explored in this installation. This is uh, After Image by Linda Beaumont, and it's two light boxes with images of trees from the Pacific Northwest Forest. Uh, you can see they frame the view out to the forest, the bittersweet thing is that um, these images will soon be blocked, or the actual forest will be blocked by another building. So the artist is saving that image for uh, the people inside this structure. Next slide. The artist's statement, the magnificent forest that once grew in the Pacific Northwest touches the edge of our memories with an after image, both retinal and physical. The beauty of growth, the nature of time, and a sense of awe are held in a single tree. Next. Uh, this work is actually on a traffic medium, Seagrass by Barbara Graditis, and it's inspired by seagrass moving, uh, ebbing and flowing in water. It's composed of a series of pieces that are infused with LED light, and that creates a constant shimmering. This is a pretty fantastic installation, um, Harmonic Convergence by Christopher Janney, and it's in um, the Miami International Airport. We found a lot of really um, that's gorgeous uh, public art in airports. And uh, she, she, uh, he is using a uh, diagonal pattern of colored glass, and then uh, the glass is integrated with a interactive sound score and so as um, people move through this area, they activate um, a soundscape. And what's really wonderful about this is the soundscape is sounds from the Florida natural environment. So local bird songs, um, the sound of the storm, uh, sounds um, from the Everglades. And then the other thing is as the light moves, 
uh, changes position throughout the day, the colored shadows also change. Another airport piece, uh, Bay Area Bird Encounters. And um, this is meant to create a playful oasis in the airport for people of all ages. So in the next slide, you'll see it better, but the two benches actually simulate um, a bird's wings. And they can be played um, like a xylophone. So there's a rubber mallet that um, people can use and, and play a song. If you play it from left to right, it uh, will actually uh, be part of the bird's song. And then next slide. So you can see the, the child playing. And everything is tuned so that if you play more than one at a time, they, they um, are in tune. And I'll turn it, turn it over to Jenny. All right, so um, this first piece here, West Hollywood Library Mural, created by street artists Shepard Ferry, Kenny Schraff, and Retina. Um, they took the parking garage at the West Hollywood Library, and each of the three artists took the project in a different direction, but they were all inspired by West Hollywood or the structure. Um, where the um, parking garage was located. So this first piece is by Shepard Ferry called Peace Elephant, and it is inspired by the West Hollywood area being one of the first areas to um, protest the war in Iraq. And the mural on the right is by Schraff, and it is inspired by the playground that is across the street from the parking garage and inspired by um, the playfulness and the children that would be looking onto the parking garage. And then the piece on the left is by Retina and he was inspired by a quote by Salmon Rushdie about the power of literature and so he thought about the role of the library in the community and created his mural based on that. Next, I have an image of Flying Carpet by Saeed Alabi, and this is um, by um, 50 miles of the Sacramento River Valley <coughs> that is scaled down um, to become 50 yards in an uh, airport walkway. So the artist was trying to uh, remind travelers of the magic of flight. Um, so it's a pretty wonderful piece. And here are a couple other images of that piece. And next is Souls of Trees by Heather Carter. And this is another piece in a library. Um, she created 11 structures out of pine. Um, and she used as inspiration the role that trees have in the world to sustain life. And she offset the carbon that was emitted during the project by planting three trees outside the library. And this is another piece that is within a library, um, Parabiosis by Kendall Buster. Um, so these uh, billowing structures are above the information desk and um, are meant to make you think of a, an organism taking a deep breath <coughs> or of blimps. Um, next is Leap by Lawrence Argent, and this is inside the uh, Sacramento International Library. Um, the artist really thought about the architecture, um, thought about the rabbit jumping through the ceiling. You can see the glass. Um, really integrated it into the architecture. Um, and the rabbit is red to symbolize the hurriedness that people feel in airports while they're trying to get their baggage. Um, the rabbit is jumping into the baggage area onto a suitcase <coughs> of a vortex. Um, and the next piece is Heart and Mind by Ralph Helmick. Um, is in the um, Oregon Tech Science Building, um, and the pieces are suspended from
from certain angles, it looked like um, disjointed hanging pictures, and then from other angles, you can see the unified image of a brain or of a heart. And these pieces are meant to embody the spirit of investigation and discovery that takes place in the sciences. And next is Core Sample, and this is another piece that was made for a library. The um, different layers are created by coloring cement, and artifacts are embedded into each of the layers. Um, the very top layer is cement from the library project, so it's from 2011. And then the next layer down happened during construction and have embedded in it styrofoam cup that a library, that a uh, construction worker dropped on the site. And then as you progress down, um, different artifacts from uh, farther and farther back in time are embedded. So it's a very interesting piece that really has the history of the site in it. Um, so there's a, a layer, a few um, down that has uh, glass from 1740, uh, pottery shards from Spanish mis missionaries, um, and then it goes all the way down to fossils that are from 108 million BC. So, um, yeah, pretty interesting structure, and it's meant to inspire um, people to investigate into history as well as investigate what's on the library shelves. And um, it's a piece by Chris Sauter. And the next piece is the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. And um, this piece features pillars with quotes by, um, quotes taken from Martin Luther King's speeches. Um, the spiral walkway um, starts out with um, part of his I Have a Dream speech. And um, not only is it a space for public events, but it's also a space for private reflection. Um, and it's by Barbara Reed Regis. Um, and this is the final piece I have to show. It's Around Town by Larry Kirkland. Um, so this long bench is near the um, Bus Maintenance and Administration Building. Um, on either side are large black structures that are meant to um, remind viewers of tires, um, etched into the benches are um, images from the um, local area. So we've got uh, local landmarks and wildlife and also the local fight song. Um, and so you can see on the right, we've got the local fight song and um, we can see some of the other images on the left. Um, so, Trisha and I have shown some examples of um, ephemeral pieces that use sound and light, and also some, we've had a lot of examples that are more stable and permanent. Um, so there are many possible directions that this project could go. Um, so thank you very much for watching our, um, watching our uh, presentation. <laughs>